Good evening. How are you all? I am happy to hear that. The fourth man in the furnace. Now, today there is such an attack on Christ in the world that it actually boggles the mind. One cannot believe what is being said and what one hears. John 18, 38, Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Spotless, Son of God, no fault at all. And yet he was condemned to death. But the question still remains. What is truth? Truth is very precious, and if you find it, you mustn't let go of it. Well, we've spoken about it before. Let's recap. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Now, most people today believe thy word is myth. But the Bible says, thy word is truth. So we have some choices that we can make. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, even representatives of the World Council of Churches say that when Jesus said this, he was mistaken. Fascinating. So is this truth or is it fiction? Psalms 119 verse 151. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. So the word is truth. He is the truth. And his law is truth. Psalm 119 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. And those are the definitions of truth in the Bible. And as we have seen, the word is under attack in the world. Nobody believes the literal account of Genesis. Nobody believes, or hardly anyone believes, in a literal universal flood. And that means every writer referring to it, even including the words of Jesus himself, must be under suspicion because he said when the flood came, it took how many of them away? All of them away. So the word is under attack. Jesus as the only way is under attack. The commandments certainly are under attack. And the law is no more. So when the world has truth, it seems it is followed very rapidly by apostasy. So the early church had truth, and very rapidly apostasy came along until we had what is called the Dark Ages. And that called for reformation. And so the reformers rediscovered the word like Ezra the scribe had rediscovered the lost scroll and said, here is truth. And they said, sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. Sola gratia, saved by grace and saved by grace alone. Sola Christos, Jesus Christ and him alone. And here you had a reestablishment of what the Bible called truth. And that was the Reformation, by definition. And then you got a counter-Reformation. Well, where are we today? Don't we need a restoration? Isn't that where we are today? Isn't it a fact that that which is in the Bible, is no longer believed today. 
And if a reformation put it back on track, and we've lost it since then, well, then we need a restoration. What happens when one accepts light and then rejects it? That's a serious thing. The Bible says, My soul takes no pleasure in him that shrinks back. Once you have embraced something and you know it's truth and then you shrink back, that's not a very nice thing. But there's something worse that can happen. Matthew 12, verse 45. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. So if you've cleaned the house, the soul temple, of all the lies and all the drivel that is out there in the world, and you don't fill it with something good, then those demons, said Jesus, go out, he goeth and he taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Is it possible that we are living in a generation where demonic Forces are increasing. Isn't that one of the signs of the last days? Increase in demonic activity. Well, just read Matthew 24 and you will see that that is exactly the case. And it seems to me that if you had truth, then you are seven times more inclined to leave it once you decide to reject it. Joshua 24, 14, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. So there's a choice that had to be made in ancient days. Choose between truth and error. Between the gods of the Egyptians and the Lord. Choose. Psalms 25 verse 5, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Did you know that there is only one God of salvation? There's only one. All the religions of the world don't believe in the atonement. There's only one religion that has salvation built into it. That's quite sobering. Well, today we don't want one religion. We want unity of all religions. And that means that the supremacy of Christ will have to be sacrificed to the new dogma. Or else, how is it going to fit in? So we don't need, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. We need a convergent Christ. We need a new Christ. One that will, well, let's see what Teilhard de Chardin has to say about that. Tyler de Chardin was the think tank, the philosopher, as it were, of the United Nations. He is the most quoted New Ager in the world, and he was, of course, a Jesuit. That's not my fault. It's just a fact. Tyler dreamed of humanity merging into God and each realizing his own godhood at the omega point. This belief has inspired many of today's New Age leaders. In fact, Chardin is one of the most frequently quoted writers by leading New Age occultists. So here is Tyler de Chardin, and he's waiting for this omega point where everything fuses into a pantheistic whole. And he writes 
in Christianity and evolution, a general convergence of religions upon a universal Christ who satisfies them all. That seems to me the only possible conversion of the world and the only form in which a religion of the future can be conceived. Now what he is saying is absolutely logical. If we want to stop strife and war and religious conflict on this planet, then we have to unite around a convergent Christ, a universal Christ who satisfies them all. We will have to give up the exclusivity of our individual Christs and make him a conglomerate Christ, one that embraces everything. The question is, will that Christ be Jesus Christ? That is the question. Well, Ruth Montgomery, one of the heralds of the New Age, tells us that her spirit guide stated, in the 21st century, the soul of another perfected being will return to human incarnation. Another perfected being. Fascinating. Montgomery's walk-in friend is called Michael. It's interesting that the name Michael, Michael, means he who is what? God is. He wrote, or she wrote, his words. Christ will, will arrive at the beginning of a new era after the shift and the chaos. But it will not be the man who was once incarnate and known as Jesus. It will be another wise one. Ah, okay. So this universal Christ will not be Jesus Christ. Tom Lyle, writing about the fabulous New Age, says the appearance of another Messiah has also been anticipated. So we need this new Messiah, this universally acceptable Messiah. Now if Jesus said he was the only way, then who is this guy? There is a conflict here theologically, isn't that so? Just plain logic tells us that there must be a conflict. And then, of course, you have people who say that there is a God out there, yes. But this thing called religion, phew, pathetic. Nothing but old wives' tales and old uh, religions of paganism all blended into one. And this idea of a God who will judge the world and the story about Jesus and all of these issues, scrap it. We need to start new with our religious experience. And so we have movies going out into the world and uh, projects. I don't know whether you've heard of Zeitgeist. Have you heard of that one? It's an interesting name. Zeit is time, Geist is spirit, spirit of the time. And I just want to play a short clip of what this man is saying, but uh, he uses some rather extraordinary language, and so when you hear a then you must know that we've bleeped him. <laughs> <laughs> the more you begin to investigate, what we think we understand, where we came from, what we think we're doing, the more you begin to see we've been lied to. We've been lied to by every institution. What makes you think for one minute that the religious institution is the only one that's never been touched? The religious institutions of this world are at the bottom of the dirt. The religious institutions in this world are put there by the same people who gave you your government, your corrupt education, who set up your international banking cartels, because our masters don't give a about you or your family. 
All they care about is what they have always cared about, and that's controlling the whole world. We have been misled away from the true and divine presence in the universe that men have called God. I don't know what God is, but I know what he isn't. And unless and until you are prepared to look at the whole truth, and wherever it may go, whoever it may lead to, if you want to look the other way, or if you want to play favorites, then somewhere along the line you're going to find out you're messing with divine justice. The more you educate yourself, the more you understand where things come from, the more obvious things become, and you begin to see lies everywhere. You have to know the truth and seek the truth, and the truth will set you free. Because I got to tell you the truth, folks. I got to tell you the truth. When it comes big time, major league, you have to stand in awe of the all-time champion of false promises and exaggerated claims, religion. Think about it. Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day and the invisible man has a special list of 10 things he does not want you to do and if you do any of these 10 things he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time but he loves you. <laughs> he loves you. He loves you and he needs money. He always needs money. He's all powerful, all perfect, all knowing and all wise. Somehow, just can't handle money. Religion takes in billions of dollars, they pay no taxes, and they always need a little more. Now, you talk about a good, good story. Holy... Wow. <laughs> well, I don't think he thinks too much of religion, right? And then he goes on with a movie, and I'm not going to play the whole thing, of course. And he explains how everything we see can be traced back to ancient Babylon. But of course he's confusing very many things. And if he had studied religion, then he would have found out that he's not the only one who traces back many of the things in so-called religion up, up there in the world back to Babylon. You can just read Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons and you will find that he's spot on when it comes to some of the Babylonian features in mega religions of the world today. But that's not Christianity. And this concept that we have here and this concept of this wrathful God who does sizzle fits, sizzle fits when uh, you don't obey him is a concept which is very far removed from the Bible. And the concept of the Messiah, he has no concept whatsoever of the Messiah because he totally ignores history and prophecy. And so I feel sorry for the man and wish he could learn something about these things. But the sad thing is, here is a man who has a concept of God. He knows there must be something out there. But he cannot stand the rubbish he's being fed. I have sympathy with that. I fell in that category, so I have sympathy with him. Here I was, 
And I was being taught that my mother was going to roast for all eternity because she did not accept a specific brand of Christianity. And this is what I was being taught. And so at an early age, I became an atheist. And I said, I want nothing to do with a God like that. Don't mess with the little boy's mother. Any case, I remained an atheist for a long, long time until I discovered the Bible and discovered the real power in the Bible. Now this is a person who rejects, in zeitgeist, the whole concept of this religious thing out there. But look what people within Christianity are doing. There's a group of people who formed an organization called the Jesus Seminar. And these people are the ones who are going around the world training theology-centered institutions. They are the ones who are going around the world to the theological schools who hobnob it with the lecturers and professors of theology and who present seminars to theological students. So these are not just fringe people. These are central to Christianity. Well, what do they talk about? When they talk about the atonement, Jesus, for example, they talk about gross paternal misconduct of the Father as he pours out his divine wrath on his Son. They also deny the divinity, the virgin birth, the resurrection of Jesus. That's too much for the modern mind. Modern society discards Jesus without regard to prophecy as a figment of the imagination on the one hand, and embraces all religions as divinely inspired on the other. Now, isn't that confusion? So you have this dichotomy in the world. We all want to be religious. We all want to have this euphoria of feeling. But uh, don't bother me with the details. So today there are anti-Trinitarian movements. There are Israel vision movements. There are Judeo-Christian conglomerates. Christianity is the most divided religion on the planet. That's fascinating. You know, there's an old axiom which says, divide and rule. Divide and rule. So, pure logic tells me, hey, <laughs> where must I look if I am a searcher of truth? I've dabbled in the occult. I could do all those funny things and oobs and all of these ridiculous out-of-body experiences. I was trained in that. I could do it. Atheist, but an atheist is not someone who doesn't believe anything. He believes everything. <laughs> so things can happen. So here we have all of these strange things in the world. Let's listen to Professor Crossan from the Jesus Seminar. Now here is a very prominent man who goes round from theological institute to theological institute as a speaker, and he speaks to the faculties of theology, and he has a tremendous influence, and this kind of thinking is permeating Christianity today. Let's listen to him. But I think we should hear it for what it is. It's like transcendental child abuse. If God can do that, then what kind of a God are we talking about? I really think we have to ask the question again of the character of God. If God is like that, we have sinned, and since we are inadequate people to be punished, God substitutes for us his own son, then of course we love that son, but we should hate that father. We really should. So we should love the Son and we should hate the Father because we are inadequate people to be punished, so let's punish the Son. Now, that is a concept of God which is so far amiss 
that it boggles the mind that modern theologians can even think like this. You see, you can only fall into this trap if you reject the divinity of Christ. If you reject the divinity of Christ, and Christ is a created being, and God is pouring out His wrath upon His Son, then you end up with this theology. You have no choice. But if Christ is a divine being, who's punishing whom? Then He's taking it upon Him Himself. He says, I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Then the story changes. Then it is not divine wrath being poured out on the one, but the price being paid by God himself. So there's a vast difference between the two theologies. Today we don't believe anything anymore in the world out there. If we had to put into a big bowl what the mega theologians and church leaders of the world believe, we would be stunned at the kind of stew that we are being dished up. Well, let's ask the famous Nobel Prize winning bishop how he feels about the resurrection, how he feels about the ascension, and all of these key features in the Gospels. Let's ask him. Oh, I am square in the Catholic faith that is uh, enshrined in our books, in our formularies, in, in, in the creed. Mm. But again, uh, my dear friend, when, when we say Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, mm -hmm. you don't believe that um, he got a kind of ecclesiastical lift that uh, took him into the stratosphere. Why don't you, I believe you, that? You, you already, in your mind, if you are a thinking Christian, realize that this is language that is being used figuratively. Uh, when we speak even about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is not the revivification yes. of, of a corpse. Yes. Oh. It is speaking about a tremendous reality mm. that Jesus Christ is risen, his life. He doesn't believe in the resurrection and he doesn't believe in the ascension. And this is the Nobel Prize laureate, bishop of the church, feeding the flock. Interesting, huh? Interesting. Well, let's listen to Professor Marcus Bohr. He's fascinating. He's also of the Jesus Seminar and a very influential theologian. What do you have to say, sir? I believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but I have absolutely no idea if it involved anything happening to his corpse. I think it's quite possible that his body was eaten by dogs, and that there was never even a full tomb, to say nothing of an empty tomb. But my basic claim here is that resurrection does not need to involve something happening to a corpse. How I understand the resurrection of Jesus is that the followers of Jesus continue to experience him as a living reality after his death. So Jesus was probably eaten by dogs. There was no resurrection. But his followers kept on experiencing him. What does that make Jesus? It makes him just a normal human being like everyone else. Founder of a religion. But it certainly brings him down from where he was. Now... This is Pope Benedict speaking. And uh, he says the following. Pope Benedict meets interreligious leaders, interreligious leaders, so this is not just Christians, these are all of the religious groups together, and says, dialogue discovers truth. Washington, Pope Benedict XVI encouraged interreligious leaders 
to work not only for peace, but for the discovery of truth. The Pope told about 200 representatives of Islam, Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Judaism gathered at Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, April 17, to persevere in their collaboration to serve society and enrich public life. So we have to get all the religions together so that we can discover truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What is Islam, Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Judaism going to do with that one? Uh, not too much, right? <laughs> Let's get rid of that one. Thy word is truth. Oh, what are all these religions going to do with that one? All thy commandments are truth. Well then, uh, the Sabbath's going to be a problem for some of them. Is that not so? So it's better that we get together as a think tank so that we can discover truth. And by definition, that truth must be a new truth which satisfies them all. We need a shift in religion. Author Patrick Campbell, who writes The Mystical Jesus, and Episcopal Bishop J.S. Spong are two of the number of individuals who have suggested that the virgin birth account clearly recognized mythological elements in our faith, tradition, whose purpose was not to describe a literal event, but to capture the transcendent dimension of God and the earthbound words and concepts of the first century human beings. Those primitive human beings of the first century. Do you know what? We read the writings of Paul and we scratch our head and we say they're so profound, it takes a huge study to even to begin to comprehend them. But when we think of the first century, we think of these primitive people walking around with clubs. Now, Funk is another man from the Jesus Seminar. We've heard some of their professors speaking. Let's hear what he has to say. He says, we should give Jesus a demotion. It is no longer credible to think of Jesus as divine. Jesus' divinity goes together with the old theistic way of thinking about God. The plot. These are Christians, please remember. The plot early Christians invented for a divine redeemer figure is as archaic as the mythology, mythology in which it is framed. A Jesus who drops down out of heaven performs some magical act that frees human beings from the power of sin, rises from the dead and returns to heaven is simply no longer credible. Now please note that it's not just Funk who is saying this. Who else said it? Bishop Desmond Tutu, one of the leading figures in the Anglican Church. He says the same thing. This is not... Sideline, this is mainstream. The notion that he will return at the end of time and sit in cosmic judgment is equally incredible. We must find a new plot for a more credible Jesus. Wow. We need a think tank. In re-articulating the vision of Jesus, we should take care to express ourselves in the same register as he employed in his parables. And aphorisms, paradox, hyperbole, exaggeration, metaphor. Further, our reconstructions of his vision should be provisional, always subject to modification and correction. Isn't that fascinating? Thy word is truth. And the Bible says, do not add and do not detract. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus Christ says, Hebrew 13, 8, the same yesterday, today, and forever. No, these modern theologians are saying, no, 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 no. 
We need modification and correction. We must correct the Bible. Here's another funk quote. Speaking about the commandments of God. Written with the finger of God, mind you. A Christianity without God must reject the commandments of God. The Father and Jesus Christ thus giving way to moral re relativism. That's what I say. Funk proclaimed. The Bible does not contain fixed objective standards of behavior that should govern human behavior for all time. This includes the Ten Commandments as well as the admonitions of Jesus. Let's get rid of them, says Funk. The coming of the Radical Reformation. We don't need the Ten Commandments. And we don't need the admonitions of Jesus. So we'll just scratch them out of the Bible as unnecessary baggage. Isaiah has something else to say. Isaiah chapter 5, 20 to 24. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as the dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Does it qualify, yes or no? I'm just reading what the Bible says and what these people are saying. Gearing. Here's another great theologian. Now he goes, he, he likes the extremes. He writes a book called Christianity Without God. Can you imagine something like that? It's a fascinating theology. There is no place for the traditional figure of Christ as the divine Savior. Yet, he writes, there, are, there is certainly a place for Jesus the teacher, the man of wisdom, the man who re revitalized the path to freedom of relevance to us, is not the Jesus who was elevated into a mythical heaven. Did uh, other people talk like this? An ecclesiastical lift? But Jesus... The fully human person who shares the tension, enigmas, and uncertainties that we experience. It is Jesus who told stories which shock people out of their traditional ways of thinking and behavior, who can free us from the mindsets in which we have become imprisoned. The Jesus most relevant to us is he who provided no ready-made answers. But by his tantalizing stories prompted people to work out their most appropriate answers to the problems of life. That is why the parables of the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son will be remembered long after the historical confessions and creeds have been forgotten. Christianity can exist without God. Indeed, Christianity without God has actually been in our midst for quite some time. It has been coming quietly, unheralded, and unnoticed. It was Christianity without God which made possible the series of emancipations mentioned above. Indeed, they may even be regarded as manifestations of the coming of the very kingdom of which Jesus spoke. This is fascinating. Just as the early church saw evidence of the coming of the kingdom in such events as the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, so we may say that though there is yet a long way to go, we can rejoice to see positive changes taking place. I wonder what these positive changes are. There is increasing personal freedom to think and speak. Is there? Is there? The slaves are being freed, patriarchy is crumbling, homosexuals are free to come out, weapons of mass, mass destruction are being widely condemned, racist attitudes are being overcome, equality of the sexes is being achieved, the disadvantaged are no longer being ignored, human worth and values are being increasingly honored. So here is the new religion, out with the old, 
in with the new. We need a new set of human values, and that is the kingdom. Hmm. Delightful kingdom. Funk, writing about the canon. The New Testament is highly uneven and biased record of orthodox attempts to invent Christianity. So nothing there is of any value. The canon of scripture adopted by traditional Christianity should be contracted and expanded simultaneously to reflect respect for the old tradition and openness to the new. Isn't that interesting? Only the works of strong poets, those who startle us, amaze us with a glimpse of what lies behind the rim of present light, should be considered for inclusion. The canon should be a collection of scriptures without a fixed text and with either, without either inside or outside limits. Like myths of the King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table or the myth of the American West. These must all come into the Bible. <laughs> I like it, the coming radical reformation. So we have all kinds of reformations. We have this coming radical reformation, and we have a rekindling of the reformation. And the choice is whose? Ours. Now, if we're going to have this universal Christ who satisfies them all, and Jesus has been demoted from his divine seat and his death, his resurrection, his ecclesiastical lift have been all mythologized. Well, now we're ready to join hands with whomsoever denies his divinity. And then we can all come together in a nice, beautiful, universal soup religion that satisfies them all, and we can wait for this coming glorious Messiah. Did Buddhism influence early Christianity? Here's uh, the writing, the original Jesus, the Buddhist sources of Christianity. And it gives all the parallels between the religions, and then it says, well, there you see. But isn't it true that if you want to counterfeit something, if you want to be another god, and surely you will counterfeit truth. Remember that Christianity is the only religion with an atonement. The only religion. No other God out there has an atonement. So Jesus is put on a par with Buddha. There they are on a par. And here they're put on a par with Krishna. So we have these floating Jesuses. And uh, I'm always a little bit fascinated that the Krishnas and the Buddhas always stand just a tad higher <laughs> than Jesus. They always stand a tad higher. And of course, there is no problem embracing all of these religious thoughts. You know, it's fascinating. Buddhism teaches that you have to empty yourself and make yourself empty and when you are in the state of nirvana, you've reached the state of cosmic fusion and you have reached the state of nothingness. Christianity, rather than emptying you, teaches I've come to give you life to the full. So it is a filling in. The two are diametrically opposite. So people say, but that's fine because we believe in yin-yang. So... That's fine. And uh, what the Dalai Lama believes about God and cosmic fusion seems to be fine for the papacy. And what he is whispering into the ear of our beloved Desmond could just have confused him perhaps because he sounds so confused when he says these things on television. And Christ must be Buddhized. Christ as Buddha in New Rome's newest church in India. And so we have a fusion of Christ. And Pope endorses cult of the 17th century flying monk, Saint Joseph of Corpatino. He was a levitator. 
And uh, they tried to catch him, to take him to the Inquisition, to ask him how he did these things, but fortunately he levitated away and drifted over the hills of Rome. And so they decided it would be better to make him a saint. Isn't that nice? And Pope Paul, Pope John Paul, honored him. Ecumenical Buddhism. Buddhism, as well as Taoism and Confucianism, explained, especially for the Western Christian mind, an exploration of what unites Buddhism and the Eastern thought to other more Western religions, rather than what separates them. Yes, this blog is somewhat universalist in its syncretism and ecumenism, saying that a Christian, a saint, or even Jesus Christ can be a Buddhist. So Jesus can be a Buddhist. That's amazing. Is he God? Is he the Son of God? Is he the only way to salvation? Or can he now become a Buddhist? Or an Orthodox Christian? Who cares? One of the two. He can take his choice. So we can be all things to all men. Here is Pope John Paul II receiving the tilak, the bindi, the red dot, the sign of Shiva. If you read in Blavatsky's writings, Shiva, she makes synonymous with Lucifer. Blavatsky says so, not me. All things to all men. Pope John Paul II on the one side, Pope Benedict on the other side, receiving the blessing from an aborigine priest. All things to all men. How about voodooism? Here we have the embracing of voodooism. Voodoo is a religion originating in West Africa that is also widely practiced in Haiti and in other places. It is characterized by various rites of homage to the great master or good god who is the creator of the spirits responsible for protecting human beings. The great God and the spirits are identified with the Christian God and the saints of the Catholic Church. The calendar of voodoo feasts imitates that of Christian worship. Voodoo ceremonies consist of rituals invoking spirits and the great God are marked by drums and songs accompanying an animal sacrifice. The rite culminates in a trance in which the ritual dancer is thought to be possessed by a divinity, a lao, a lesser god. Ceremonies are conducted by a man, a hungang, or a woman, a mambo, who are often knowledgeable about witchcraft as well. No problem. We have a universal soup. We can endorse shamanism. Here we have the papacy endorsing shamanism. And we can embrace Islam and kiss the Quran. Pope kisses the Quran after an audience with Patriarch Raphael I of Iraq. And Pope Benedict is happy to receive this gift. We are going to unite the religions. We will redefine Jesus Christ. This is taken from Osservatore Romana. This is the official mouthpiece of the Vatican. Muslims like Jews and Christians see the figure of Abraham as a model of unconditional submission to the decrees of God. Following Abraham's example, the faithful strive to give God his rightful place in their lives as the origin, teacher, guide, and ultimate testimony of all beings, Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. Message to Muslims for the end of Ramadan. This human docility and openness to God's will is translated into an attitude of prayer which expresses the existential condition of every person before the Creator. You see, it's hard to begin your religion with Christ. Because you have a problem with Muslims and you have a problem with Jews. So let's backtrack a little bit. Let's not even begin with Jacob or Isaac. Let's backtrack a little bit. Let's go to Abraham. Ah, we have a common denominator. Problem solved. We need an Abrahamic religion. Fascinating. Fascinating. 
Pope John Paul II, taken from Osservatore Romane, Muslims and Christians adore the one God. Same God. Christians, Muslims believe in the same God, the one God. Fascinating. We believe in the same God, the one God, the living God, the God who created the world and brings his creatures to their perfection. This is the Pope speaking. Now, does Allah have a son? I'm just asking a question. Does he have a son? Did he send a son to come and die for the sins of the world. A son who is one with divinity. Okay. This one doesn't have a son. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then they quote the New Testament. This is fascinating. Letter written by Pope John Paul II addressed to my beloved Muslim brothers and sisters. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not knocking Muslims. They are very, very ardent in their faith. And they want to do what is right. I had many Muslim students. And I got on very well with my Muslim students. But when it comes to theology, then you have to look at the various issues of faith. He says, the Pope says, I close my greeting to you with the words of one of my predecessors, Pope Gregory, the seventh who wrote in 1076 already to Al Nasir, the Muslim ruler. We believe in and confess one God, admittedly in a different way, in a daily praise and venerate him, the creator of the world and the ruler of this world. It's one and the same God, according to them. Here is the Catholic News Services. Washington, more than any pontiff in modern history, Pope John Paul II made important overtures to non-Christian religions. Using documents, prayer, meetings, personal visits to open the doors of dialogue. Pope John Paul advanced the church's sometimes difficult relations with Islam by visiting a mosque, speaking to Muslim groups on their foreign trips and insisting on full religious freedom in countries under Islamic law. And again he emphasized in this article, we believe in the same God, the one God, the living God. And then he visited the famous Umdayat Mosque. It's probably the oldest mosque in the world, in Damascus. Pope made important overtures to non-Christian religions. Pope John Paul was convinced that prayer could bring believers together an idea that inspired the 1986 World Day of Prayer for Peace in Assisi. The great Assisi gathering, which was, well, it's being kept every year as a memorial. That unprecedented gathering at the Pope's invitation drew leaders from the Jews, the Buddhists, the Shintoists, the Muslims, the Zoroastrians, the Hindus, the Unitarians, the traditional African and Native American religions, and many other together under the roof of the Basilica of St. Francis. They all prayed side by side with Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant leaders for world peace. And there it was. They were all together. There's the Dalai Lama and the Orthodox churches, and they're all one happy family. This is the Umdayat Mosque inside. And these are the sounds that you will hear there. So you can see the same kind of rituals, the prayer beads, all of these things, very similar to Catholicism. And inside the mosque, you have the shrine. And here you have people venerating this shrine inside the mosque. Now, fascinating, 
this shrine is a memorial to a deceased person whose head is enshrined here in this memorial center. And the individual is none other than John the Baptist. So his head is there. And if you go to Istanbul, then there are other parts of John the Baptist. Interesting, there are three parts of him claimed to be around. Pope Benedict speaks with Muslims, leaders, delegation in the United States here in 2008, in this very year. And Benedict, Benedict prays barefoot at the Blue Mosque. Earlier this month, during his visit to Istanbul, back Turkey's admission into the EU, prayed towards Mecca in a mosque and called Islam a religion of peace, tolerance and love. Overtures. Here he is inside the mosque. Benedict is guided through the Blue Mosque in Istanbul. He's the only the second pope in history after John Paul II's visit in 2001, to set foot in a Muslim house of worship. The long reign of Pope John Paul II was marked by the dominant conflict of the age, the Cold War. And this pope has to solve the crisis between religions. So here we have a new ecumenical drive. Apparently, he disturbed them by saying certain things about violence and religion, and there were many, many riots all over the world, outrage over Benedict's remarks. I would like to suggest that nothing, nothing leaves the lips that isn't carefully, carefully weighed and planned. As a consequence, there was a defense and a cry that this is not the Muslim religion. And many, many leading leaders in, in the Islamic world wrote letters and sent a common document to the Vatican claiming they are a religion of peace. And the Pope said they are a religion of peace. That dialogue is in fact vital necessity in which in large measure our future depends, Benedict says, in his call for reciprocity in all fields, including religious freedom. Benedict was quoting his predecessor. Now this is marvelous. If we can have peace between the religions, great! Then this conflict will suddenly end. But what if the price is the sacrificing of the exclusivity of Christ? Saudi Arabia was not represented at Monday's meeting. Leaders from many other Muslim states were on hand, among them Egypt, Indonesia, Iraq, Lebanon, Sudan, Turkey, Iraqi representatives, the whole world came together there, the whole Islamic world. The Holy Father indicated a profound respect for Islam. And he said, it is now the time to put what happened behind all of us and to begin building a bridge between the two faiths. Time to unite. We need unity of religion. Pope calls for dialogue with Muslims. And here they come together around their table and we have the great gathering. And the magazine, Osservatore Romana, the official mouthpiece. They're pushing this agenda like you cannot believe. Special of the USA Today in the meeting, the Vatican says, was unprecedented in scope. Benedict told 20 Muslim ambassadors Monday, that he is committed to positive dialogue with Islamic leaders and our future depends on the development of strong relations between the two faiths. And they were so proud of it, they put it on the front page of Le Osservatore Romane. Fascinating. World Religious Conference, official website of this Islamic movement. We affirm the value of interfaith interaction for educating ourselves regarding other faiths and philosophical traditions, the interfaith concept is a unifying vehicle which can aid us in bringing the reformation of the world nearer to reality. So we need a reformation. But is this a reformation within Christianity? I don't believe so. This is a universal reformation for world peace and unity. 
And the Bible says when they say what? Peace. Peace. Then comes what? Sudden destruction. Now, let's investigate this a little bit. This is the Holy Quran. Transliteration in Roman script by Abdul Halim Elasi. And this is what the Quran has to say. The end of Christ and the Bible and the Quran. But the Quran says, Christ was altogether saved from the indignity of the cross. Excuse me. Did you understand that? Christ never died on the cross, the Quran says. And as if it were by a miracle of likeness, someone else of the same features was crucified by the Jews under illusion. Says the Quran, verse 157, And they Jews said in boast, We killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God, and the knowledge of God. But they killed him not, nor crucified him, but it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjectures to follow. For a surety they killed him not. So the Quran says Jesus never died for you. It was an illusion because if he was a holy prophet, God would not have let that happen. And poops, took him away. And people were deceived into believing that he died. Holy Quran, verse 158. Nay, God raised him up unto himself, and God is mighty wise, and there is none of the people of the book but must believe on him. Christ before his death on the day of judgment, he, Christ, will be witness. VD 157 to 159, verse 4. Christ never died for you. Fascinating. While the Jews claim to have killed Christ on the cross, he is also a, it's a, also a cardinal point of faith to the Orthodox Christian churches that A, Jesus Christ gave up his life on the cross, and B, he was buried after the crucifixion, C, on the third day he rose in body with his wounds fresh, and D, he met his disciples, and F, was afterwards taken up bodily to heaven. In fact, this is the belief which forms the basis of the theological doctrine of blood sacrifice and vicarious atonement for sins, which is, however, losing force with the modern age, an age of action and retribution. Comment in this Quran, page 26. Fascinating. And they're right. It is losing force. Even the bishop is saying, Oh, you don't believe there was a resurrection or an ecclesiastical lift? Maybe it was eaten by dogs, said Borg. And you know, who cares? This is all spiritualized away. And there the problem is solved and the way is open for unity talks. Quran. God is indignant if Christ is to be believed to be God himself. Vide 19, 5, 75, 78, 5. To say nothing of Godship, Christ is not even the Son of God, but only an apostle like, ev like several others. The same is the case with Uzair, a prophet of the Jews. The priests have often been the source of trouble in religion to lead people astray and to grow rich at others' expense. It is to be accepted that Islam is the religion of truth and Muhammad is the apostle of God, says the Quran. What do we do now? Can Christianity and Islam sit at the same table? I ask the question. Quran. They do blaspheme who say God is Christ the son of Mary, but said Christ, O children of Israel, worship God, my Lord and your Lord. Quran, Surah 5, verse 58. So the Quran says the exact opposite of the Bible. Surah 19, verse 35. It befitteth not the majesty of God that he should take unto himself a son. Glory be to him when he decreeth a thing he has said unto it only be and it is. So the God of Islam doesn't have a son. The God of the Bible has a son. Can they be the same God? Question. Can they be the same God? This Protestant writer says, The Savior has said, 
He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He says again, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Mohammedanism has its converts in many lands and its advocates deny the divinity of Christ. We've just seen that. Shall this faith be propagated and the advocates of truth fail to manifest intense zeal to overthrow the error and teach men of the pre-existence of the only Savior of the world? Oh, how we need men who will search and believe the word of God and who will present Jesus to the world in his divine and human nature declaring with power and in demonstration of the Spirit that there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Oh, how we need believers who will now present Christ in life and character, who will hold him up before the world as the brightness of the Father's glory, proclaiming that God is love. Old-fashioned theology, no longer suitable for the times, does mommy have to get the Jews and the Islams together? No wonder she's got a headache. I would also have a headache if I had to do that. Spiegel, the power of faith. And here we have the symbols of the religions together and a power holding this globe in the hand. What is the dress of this power holding this globe? You know, these are fascinating signal pictures. Here we see this world conglomerate religion in the hand of the woman in red and purple. Dancing in the Lord. Let's worship the Lord. Which Lord? Daniel 3.25, and he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. King James Version. American Standard Version. And the aspect of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Wow. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. A child and a son. A prophecy 700 years before Christ. And the government shall be on his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Old Testament. The Son will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Wow. Isaiah 9 verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice and with, with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is no ordinary man we're speaking about here. Here's another quote. But one surpassing all that imagination can present came from heaven to this world nearly 2,000 years ago to voice a strange and mysterious import was heard from the throne of God. Sacrifice an offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, the prophet said. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders." And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Paul beheld Christ in his power and he wrote, 1 Timothy 3.16, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, 
seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Who was manifest in the flesh? God was manifest in the flesh. Fascinating what some modern translations do with that text. And remove God and put he in its place. Colossians 1.16, By him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. What did Paul think about Jesus Christ? He thought he was God. He said he was the creator. He was before all things. He holds all things together and he was God manifest in the flesh. Christ was using the great name of God that was given to Moses to express the idea of eternal presence. See Ex Exodus 3.14. Isaiah also saw Christ in his prophetic words are full of significance. And then this wonderful quote about the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Speaking through him, the Lord says, I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Fear not, for I am with thee. Even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Paul said, who was that? He said, it was Jesus Christ. Islam says, no, there is no son. God is indignant if we say that he has a son. When Jesus came to our world, he proclaimed himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The Lord must be believed and served as the great I am, and we must trust implicitly in him. If we want to study the deity of Christ, there are eight passages where Jesus is described by the Greek word theos, God. John 1, 1 to 3, 1, 18, 20, 28, Romans 9, 5, Titus 2, 13, Hebrews 1, 8, 2, Peter 1, 1, and 1 John 5, 20. Jesus is described as theos, God. The Gospel of John, the Apostle records, Seven miracles and seven I am statements of Jesus, including John 8, 58. Jesus said unto them, Very, verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Either he is Jesus, either he is God, or he is not. The miracles depict his omnipotence, his all-powerfulness, his omnipresence, his present everywhere, his omniscience, his all knowledge, his immutability, his unchangeable nature. If you go through those miracles of Jesus carefully, then anybody who made a study of those miracles will see that he must be God because they apply to every single one of these characteristics. You can go to any one of them where Jesus doesn't even go to the place where he heals and at that very moment a servant is healed or a child is raised. He doesn't even have to be there. He's omnipresent. Jesus heals a man born blind at the pool of Siloam. This picture is actually incorrect because he didn't find him there. He sent him there. But this is a fascinating story. Every story in the Bible has a very specific message. And the Gospel of John is the Gospel on the deity of Christ. And any Christian who understands his Bible must be very sure that he knows what he's talking about. Here is the famous pool of Siloam. And the word Siloam means sent as an apostle, as a messenger to testify to a certain issue. And here is the man born blind. And the story is fascinating. John 9, Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, Master, did this man sin or did his parents sin? Jesus said, neither of them. 
This man is not blind because of what happened to his parents or of some particular thing that he did. That's not in the character of God to go sizzle fits. As we saw in Zeitgeist, we must understand the character of God. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day the night cometh when no man can work as long as I am in the world I am the light of the world. He had something to demonstrate and so he made some clay out of spit in the ground and he touched his eyes and he who had formed man out of clay was he not able to restore man through clay? And he sent him off to the pool of Siloam and there he was healed. And then, this magnificent story. He washed. The neighbors, therefore, and they which were before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is this not he that sat and begged? Is this not he? And so, they come to him and they ask him and he says, It's me. It's me. Who did it? A man called Jesus did it. And off they take him to the Pharisees. This is he, others said he is like him, but he said, I am he, it's me. And off he went. Now they brought him to the Pharisees, the one who had been blind. And the Pharisees were infuriated. And they said, what is this thing here that's happening? Because what day was it? It was the Sabbath day. And the Lord of the Sabbath had healed a man on the Sabbath day. Can he not set a captive free on that day? We have so many misconceptions about God and his character. And they ask him, they say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he has opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Oh, they freaked. How can he be a prophet if he healed on the Sabbath day? He must be a sinner. And you aren't blind. Call his parents. So they bring his parents here. John 9, 18 to 21, they call his parents. And the parents are scared. And the parents are shivering. And they don't want to tell the Pharisees because anybody who stands up for Jesus could be accused of hate speech in those days. And so they carefully say, uh, he's of age, ask him. And yes, he was blind. We know he was blind, but how he sees now, we don't know. Ask him. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Are we close to those times today? I think we're deadly close. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again they called the man who was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise, you liar. Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. I love this answer. He answered, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. All I know is I was blind and now I see. Isn't that great? So here they are being confronted with this impossibility, a man born blind. And they said to him again, what did he do to thee? How opened thee thine eyes? And he answered them, I told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you be his disciples also? That really freaked them out. And they reviled him and said, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that this that God spoke unto Moses, but as for this fellow, who knows where the heck he comes from? The man answered and said, Why herein is a marvelous thing. I like this man. That ye know not from whence he is, and yet he has opened mine eyes. You as religious leaders, you should know better than this. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of a God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. And so they blew a gasket and they kicked him out. And this is the crux of the matter. And Jesus comes and he finds him. And he asks, Dost thou believe in the Son of God? 
And the man says, Lord, who is he? And Jesus says, the one speaking to you is he. Hmm. Wow. Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Now notice what the man does. And he said, Lord, Kyrios, I believe. And he worshipped him. He worshipped him. So what is, what is Jesus? He's God. He's God. He's the Son of God. He's God. And then he said, And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, and they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees heard it, and they freaked out again. And they said, which, which heard him, they said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. I believe history is repeating itself. There are many texts that confirm the divine nature of Christ, such as being everlasting, Isaiah 9, 6, omnipresent, Matthew 18, 20, 28, 20, John 3, 13, omniscient, John 2, 24, omnipotence, Isaiah 9, 6, Philippians 3, 21, immutability, Hebrews 1, 10, etc. Et Every aspect of de deity is embodied in Christ. The Quran says he is not. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2, 9. They can change the verses as much as they like. They cannot eradicate him from the word. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the Jehovah's Witness can change this as much as they like and make it a God. They still have it in some of the other verses. Hebrews 1, 3 who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. By himself. Not on behalf of someone else. Hebrews 1.8, And unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So the Son is, O oh God, O oh God. Colossian, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And this word depicts he who brings forth everything. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth while visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. It's so plain. Philippians 2, 6, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, my question to you is this. Did the Jews understand what Jesus meant when he said the words that he did. Did they understand that he was saying that he is God? And the answer is yes. Let's read it. John 10, 30 to 33. Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyselves God. So when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, the Jews understood what he was saying. He was saying that he is the deity, that he is God. And here's the story of the doubting Thomas. Fascinating story. John 14, 8-9. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father. And it's enough for us. Please, j j you know, just get on with it. Show him to us. What does Jesus say to him? 
Have I been so long with you and you still don't know me? Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Many who, like Thomas, wait for all cause of doubt to be removed will never realize their desire. They gradually become confirmed in unbelief. The same day, that evening, now when Jesus came back, the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut by, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Jesus had been raised from the dead and he came to his disciples and the disciples were gathered. Thomas was not there. It says so in the Bible, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he showed them his hands and his side. He was not a ghost. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. That's what the scriptures say. And then he appeared again to them. And after eight days again, his disciples were within. John 20, 26 to 28. And notice what happens now. And Thomas was there this time. And they told him that the Lord had appeared and he didn't believe it. And he said, yeah, don't touch him. Anyway, don't feel him. Forget it. He's like me. Doesn't believe. I want to see. I want to know. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it in my side, and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, What did he say to him? My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. If we remove the deity of Christ from the Bible, we are lost. Because no one has life within himself to raise himself from a, the second death, but God himself. If Jesus is not God, we are eternally lost. And yet religion is robbing him of his deity. Faith for some, doubt and despair for others. This is a fascinating story. Neither jo Joseph nor Nicodemus had openly accepted the Savior when he was living. They were always in the background. Nicodemus used to come in the dark to ask him questions. The disciples had walked with him. The disciples who were Jesus' great followers and who said... We will never leave you, even if everyone forsakes you, says Peter, not I. What happened? They all ran. And they all hid themselves for fear of the Jews. Now it's amazing how people perceive things. Here was Nicodemus, and here was Joseph. And he had asked for the body of Jesus to Pilate. When Jesus died, these two Sanhedrin members became bold. Neither Joseph nor Nicodemus had openly accepted the Savior, says this writer, while he was living. They knew that such a step would exclude them from the Sanhedrin and they hoped to protect him by their influence in its councils. Nicodemus, when he saw Jesus lifted up on the cross, remembered his words. When I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me on the Mount of Olives. As Moses lifted up the serpents on the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. On the Sabbath when Christ lay in the grave, Nicodemus had opportunity for reflection. A clearer light now illuminated his mind and the words which Jesus had spoken to him were no longer mysterious. He felt that he had lost much by not connecting with the Savior during his life. Now we recall the events of Calvary. The prayer of Christ for his murderers. Here he perceives Christ praying for a murderer. Now he recalled these events and he answered to the petition to the dying thief spoke to the heart of the learned counselor. Again he looked upon the Savior in his agony and he heard the words of the last cry. It is finished, spoken like the words of a conqueror. Again he beheld the reeling earth when that earthquake came, the darkened heavens when the sky was darkened, the rent veil in the temple, the shivered rocks, and his faith was forever established. The one lot run 
like jackrabbits, and the other one says, just like the centurion, surely this was the Son of God. The very events that destroyed the hopes of the disciples convinced Joseph and Nicodemus of the divinity of Jesus. Their fears were overcome by the courage of a firm and unwavering faith. Ezekiel says, And they come unto thee as people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. This is modern Christianity. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, they are unto them a very lovely song of one that has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. They all go to church. They all sing beautiful hymns, for they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet has been amongst them. We have a form of godliness today denying the power thereof. They wear costly robes of purple and whatever and deny the divinity of Jesus. We need to understand that we have to have a personal experience with this Savior of the world or else we will have no experience of any value whatsoever. No man can impart to another the character of the fruit of the Spirit's working and we cannot... With darkness have a union. How can those who deny the divinity of Christ sit at the same table in a religious fashion now when with those who accept his divinity? How is that possible? I'm not advocating violence. I'm just advocating cling to your faith. Don't let universal soupdom rob you of the only salvation that there is. The Bible says, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in the land, as I live, says the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. That's our choice. We can be swayed by all these winds of doctrine and by all this interreligious ecumenism. I don't mind if a person wants to be a Buddhist, let him be a Buddhist. I don't mind if he wants to be a Muslim, let him be a Muslim. But don't rob me of Jesus. And then I believe it's time to stand up and say so far and no further. Revelations eleven seventeen, Saying we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come. Because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. Who is this Lord God Almighty in this text? It's Jesus. Let's go to a modern translation. Let's go to the American Standard Version. Saying we give thee thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who art and who wast, because thou hast taken thy great power and didst reign. What's gone? So who could it be here? It can be the Father. We can leave Jesus out of this equation in this text, in the modern translation, but we can't leave him out in the old translation. We can't leave him out in the received text, but we can leave him out in the Alexandrian text. Revelation eleven seventeen in the NIV, saying we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. This is a crisis. Revelation 16, 5. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. God Almighty, the judge of all things. Who is he in this text? Jesus. ASV. And I heard the angels of the waters saying, Righteous art thou who art and who wast thou holy one, because thou didst thus judge. Gone. Revelation 16, 5. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, 
You are just in these judgments who are and who were the Holy One because you have so judged, NIV. Do they have a problem with Jesus being God? Do they need an ecumenical Bible? Revelation 3.18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, so that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. God is going to permit much turmoil on this planet. And we have to have a relationship with the only one who can save us. And we can choose to believe that he is a son of the gods. Or we can choose to believe that he is the son of God. That is our choice. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Titus says, this is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. Whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. It's going to get tough. If you want to stand for truth and righteousness, you're going to have the whole world on your neck. We do not always consider that the sanctification we so earnestly desire and for which we pray so earnestly, I like the way these people put it, is brought about through the truth and by the providence of God in a manner we least expect. When we look for joy, behold, there is sorrow. When we expect peace, we frequently have distrust and doubt because we find ourselves plunged into trial we cannot avoid. In these trials, we are having the answers to our prayers. In order for us to be purified, the fire of affliction must kindle upon us and our will must be brought into conformity to the will of God. In order to be conformed to the image of our Savior, we pass through the most painful process of refining. I believe we are in the final straight. The world is forsaking Jesus, left, right, and center. No matter how they do it, they may invoke his name, they may sing praises to him, but they are doing it by getting rid of his character, his law, and getting rid of his divinity, and trampling upon every precept of his word. They may view us in the wrong light. They may think us in error. That we are deceived and degrading ourselves. Because we follow the dictates of enlightened conscience. In seeking for the truth as for hidden treasure. The psalmist says examine me O Lord and prove me. The Lord in his providence bring men where he can test their moral powers. And reveal their motives of actions that they may improve what is right in themselves and put away that which is wrong. God would have his servants become acquainted with the moral machinery of their hearts. Now we need men of moral character, women of stature and morality to stand up and to say, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Genesis 15.1, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. What a promise. We have nothing to fear. Stand up. What happened when the disciples preached in the name of Jesus? They were taken captive. They were given a good beating. And they went off rejoicing, preaching in the name of Jesus. Be strong and of good courage, says Deuteronomy. Fear not, nor be afraid of them, for the Lord thy God, he it is that does go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Here's a promise. Luke, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. 
Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Isaiah, for now, thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob. He that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. I don't care what Zeitgeist says, I don't care what Desmond Tutu says, I don't care what all these mega theologians say. I care for what the Word of God says, and I hope you do too. And this mighty text, I quoted it just now. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is grammatically a genitive, genitive, chi construction. Now what does that mean? A genitive, genitive, chi construction is that the two aspects are linked immovably. And that makes the great God and the great Savior one and the same individual grammatically according to the Greek. You cannot separate them. And the greatest theologians who wrote these marvelous, old, powerful, Documents, concordances on the Greek will testify that this is a genitive, genitive, chi construction. Jesus is God. You cannot remove his deity. He is the fourth man in the fire. And this battle is not only about you and me and about what we believe or how we will be saved. This battle is the final conflict of Satan himself to eradicate the Son of God from the minds of men. May God give us courage to stand for righteousness and truth.